Hi, Gail Fugit, uh, President and CEO of the Advertising Research Foundation. I'm delighted to be here with David Poltrek, uh, Board Chair, actually, of the Advertising Research Foundation for the second run. And, uh, and here we are at uh, CES 2016. And uh, I, I think the best thing to say is that here you are. This is your turf, right, David? This is your, you're the Chief Research Officer at, uh, at uh, CBS and then also the president of CBS Vision. And here we are at CBS Vision. So I, I like to think that 174,999 people have come to see you this week. Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> and look, you're doing amazing uh, work here in terms of this being your uh, breakthrough emerging research platform. And uh, I had the pl great pleasure of touring this uh, this institution a year ago. And then uh, and then right after this, we're going to have a webcast. Um, but I want to just uh, take a minute and 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 back up and uh, and I want to just chat about uh, how you got here after all these years in your career. I recently um, heard a story uh, about Leslie Moonves, your, your head of CBS, uh, that, that said that he actually started out wanting to be an actor. And then he decided that he actually wanted to be maybe behind the camera instead of in front of the camera. And so that was a bit of his story. And um, believe it or not, I, I learned something new about you in the last few days, which is that you graduated from Notre Dame Magna Cum Laude in history. And so I'm wondering how you got from history to here. Okay, well, it was a convoluted path. So uh, to cut it as briefly as possible. So I, went to, I always thought I was going to be a lawyer. Okay. Between my junior and, so, and, and senior years of college, I, did, I actually got to see what goes on in law firms. It was horrifying. I said, <laughs> I can't possibly do this. I have to find something else to do. And at that time, I was, uh, my wife and I, who was in my fiancé, uh, were playing tennis regularly with a young couple. Uh, Pat, the, who, they were both actually named Pat McGrath. And Pat McGrath was the founder of Case Cronin McGrath, one of the hottest agencies at the time in uh, New York in the advertising business. And he was telling me what he did. And I said, well, that sounds like fun. So I said, well, I guess I'll just you try just to be... fell into it. Try to, be, uh, try to get into advertising. I went on that normal spring break blitz of uh, interviews right. and ended up getting job offers and became a member of the media department of Ted Bates Advertising. As soon as I got into their operation and started buying media, I realized I wanted to be on the other side selling media. And within a year and a half, I made the transition over to CBS. And here we are 46 years later, <laughs> and I'm still here. Uh, when people say, they, people expect you to have either a business degree or a statistics degree when they hear of what I do, and they, they are surprised by the history degree. I said, well, actually, when I got my history degree, I was, uh, my thesis was on the, uh, the cultural, uh, the, the cultural, social and cultural arising of the South, and it was about the concept of cultural history and social history. And I, uh, as a result of that, I say, I, that's, I've been in the middle of the cultural and social history of the United States ever s since. So as it turns out, it was perfect training Absolutely. for what I do. Absolutely. That was really prescient. I mean, I, the term tipping point even comes from that, you know, that kind of social change, turning over right. cultures yeah. and organizations and, and communities, um, not just the title of a popular, of a popular book on trends, mm -hmm. right? Um, so... I mean, look, along the way, and you've won every, every um, accolade and honor imaginable um, from uh, being uh, a, a uh, you know, an honoree at the, at, at, at the, in the Market Research Council Hall of Fame to, uh, of course, your big honor at the Broadcast Television, uh, Cable and Television uh, Award that was, that was a couple years ago. Um, and then, and then the National Association of Broadcasters has has given you accolades, and and the MRC, the Media Ratings Council, and you currently are also chairing uh, MSI's um, 
executive committee. Um, so along the way, I mean, I think that people would look at your career and it just, it's breathtakingly successful. I wonder, um, were there ever times when you lost faith or you felt, you know, frustrated or had a, had a, like, God forbid, a failure? And how did you, how did you handle those points in time when things maybe weren't going so well? You didn't see your way clear to the other side. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, there were steps along the way that uh, were precarious, to say the least. Uh, there was a, Good a, a, there was a, I was in the sales organization of CBS, uh, that's where I came in and I was a market, I was a, in charge of uh, market uh, research and marketing services and providing research support to the sales department. And we had a major, large corporate research department that had a tremendous reputation and did all the programming research and everything. It was very well known. And the leader, longtime leader of that retired, and they were looking for someone to replace that person. And it was really uh, anathema that they would put someone from the sales organization into the research organization. Mm -hmm. And it, it looked at that time like the, I, I was not going to be able to make that transition. And if I didn't, then I would go from being a part of the research, sales organization. I, they wanted me to go into the research organization uh, as a, uh, under other another mm -hmm. person, and I just decided I didn't want to work for. I had my own vision of what research was, and I didn't want to work for anyone, particularly somebody who had more of an academic ivory tower view of research. I, I was in a. I saw the application aspect of research, so I took a big step and I turned it down, and I said, "No, I'm not going to make that move," and I had a great boss at the time who said, well, they're phasing out your job, so I've got to find Good something luck. else for you to do. So he says, I got to, we have this big project, so I'm going to put you on this big project uh, that says a three-month project, and during that time, uh, I'll have to, we'll find something else for you to do. Well, that three, that project ended up being a design, a project to come up Cross with a plan to turn the sales orientation of the network sales, uh, of the, then the television station sales department, into a marketing orientation. Mm -hmm. And in working on that project, I created a new job for myself, the head of marketing services. And with, and then after a, a year and a half in that job, I got the job, the top job that I wanted originally. So. Uh, it was a case of, you know, during that time, there was a lot of discussion of, t in my own mind and with my wife about whether I should leave CBS, which I love CBS and I didn't want to leave it, but that was the one time I thought I was going to leave CBS and I had a lot of offers outside of CBS. But I hung in and eventually uh, got the, the offer for the... The, the head research job. So that, I, I mean, I, I think, and I certainly had parallels in my own career to that. I think that your your notion of kind of having a beacon of of getting the big job, and if you couldn't have the big job, um, that, that you were going to set guidelines, guardrails, boundaries, and, and be very clear. Um, where does that conviction come from? Well, I think one of the things that really comes from is that I have a tremendous support, a tremendously supportive wife. Who I've met. That's right. <laughs> you do. She's and wonderful. And she, you know, there was, she never wavered at all as to mm -hmm. the fact that you know, you, uh, you've got to go in the direction you want to and build the career you want to, even if it means uh, a momentary uh, stalling of, of the progress or even a, a, a step backwards. But she recognized that and she encouraged me to do that. And, and I think that made it a lot easier. And I also was, you know, I, 
I also was get involved in the industry and making progress. So it wasn't. Uh, I was very the the people I worked so with that was and kind the of people fuel, I like worked a, with and the people who you. I was responsible to were one hundred percent behind me yeah. and supportive of me. It wasn't. Uh, it was uh, they were trying. To, they were advocates for me to get the job. Yeah, you so. mentioned having a great boss. And that right. makes all yeah. the difference yeah, in the world. That's right. So that made it easier. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I think it's fascinating the parallels to, you know, we're heavily in, engaged in, and and I'm, I'm on the advisory committee of this Insights 2020 initiative. And it's really interesting because there's some parallels in terms of is marketing research need to be supporting sales and not just marketing now? And then what about digital marketing and data science? And um, where, how, how do we navigate those, our career paths now in the industry? Um, do you have any insights on, on that or any advice? around that? Well, I, I, I've always said that market research is a, boils down to being the consumer's advocate and voice in the corporate environment. And if you look at that, all of, then all of the device, you know, whether you're dealing with data analytics or psychographic research or biofeedback measures, mm -hmm. They're all just tools to get at the mindset of the consumer, mm -hmm. and you use them all. And so there, is, you know, I think people tend to look at market research maybe with a you know small m small r, and I look at market research with capital M capital R, and therefore I I you know, to, when see people say market research versus data analytics, I say data analytics is market research. Mm -hmm. And when they say, you know, bio, I mean, it's all, it's all market research is researching the market. Mm -hmm. But the, the voice and, of the consumer and having conviction and something that I've seen you do over and over and over again is speaking on behalf of the consumer um, and bringing, you know, decision making, bringing insight from the data to the decision making table. And I know you have the ear of senior management as well. So it's that leadership role that kind of complements yeah. that. I mean, the one good thing about getting old is people tend to listen to you more. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Excellent. Um, so I think I maybe know what the answer to this is, but what's what would you say your biggest success has been this past year? We might get a sneak peek in a few minutes, but um, at our webcast. But looking back on the year, it's been it's. I mean, look. I think. Well, I think we talked about disruption, we, all kinds yeah. of stuff. But uh, I think the. Um, the thing I'm proudest of in the short term, and, and particularly I think it came to a head and, and really developed in 2015, is we're finally moving away from demographic measurement yes. to we're moving from counting the house to, to measuring results. And we're doing it very in a very rapid way, and, it, and the industry is finally embracing it. And I think that is, uh, you know, from our parochial point of view going to allow us to really show just how powerful television advertising is as a marketing tool for from the bigger perspective from the advertising research foundation perspective and my, and my role in the marketing science institute it's going to demonstrate how important advertising is to building brand equity and as a driver of the economy yes and you know we I, i've said before uh it there is it is no coincidence that China emerged as a major consumer economy and a major economy when they started accepting television advertising. Uh, the two go together, and we're able. We have the tools now to measure that. So that's the longer-term perspective, and that's what I think really came around in 2015. When Your prediction I'm, for 2016? Well, 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 I'm particularly excited about two. Uh, two things that we've been doing for, two, for 2016. One of them will be unveiled at um, ARF Rethink, and it's something that I've been doing with Leslie Wood uh, about a new, I guess we, I, it's a worn out word, but I think it works here, a new paradigm for media planning. Yeah. And I think that encompasses the one. new media world. And I think we have a breakthrough there, and we're going to be uh, featuring that and hope 
at the very least, we'll, we're going to call it, we're going to start an interesting debate on that front. So I think that's very exciting. And the, um, what we just actually happened over the last couple of weeks is I, uh, I think we, we started with our media landscape segmentation and we've been building to, to understand what's going out there and, and what is the future direction of, me, of the media world and, the consume, and media's role in, in the lives of the public. And in the sessions we just completed here uh, over the last two weeks, I think it's finally really come, uh, become clear to me what that vision is. You'll hear some of that from me, but since most of what we learned in the last two weeks has significant strategic advantage, you won't hear it all. <laughs> yeah, you're going to keep it under keep it under cover, under lock mm -hmm. and key, right? Yes. Right. Um, so while uh, so I think for our listeners and our members. Uh, while they were, you know, drinking eggnog and opening packages, you were here doing groundbreaking research in Las in cold Las Vegas in yes, the last right, few yeah. weeks. Yes. <laughs> I yeah, the, the, the no design the was to spend two weeks in Las Vegas when you know, this is ideal for us because uh, the uh, the people who are in Las Vegas between Christmas and New Year's are representative of the total mm. pop of the population. Excellent point. They're the ideal people to talk to. Their mindset is in the right place. They've been immersed in technology because of the Christmas give, gift giving and, and that part of it. And, of mm -hmm. course, we're doing it right before CES. So it gives us a great uh, you know, current status report on what's going on right before CES. So it's worked out very ide ideally for us. And usually it gets me out of the cold, but this time it was warmer <laughs> in New York than yeah, it was right? in Las that was, Vegas. So ultimate, it, that didn't work out this the time. The ultimate irony. <laughs> so you heard it here first. Uh, we're, we're headed off to our webcast with some sneak peek at some, at some new original research. Um, you know, the f fascinating story about how your your roots in history actually had a lot to do with what you're doing today, representing the consumer at the table. Um, I think your your encouragement uh, to have a great boss and maybe an admonition admonition not just to just to take whatever comes along in terms of here this is a job for you, but bring some personal strength of conviction. Um, the spouse helps. I, I was While you were speaking, I was thinking of the day I came home and told my husband that I was going to retire, and he was terribly gracious about it, but I'm sure uh, it took that same level of, of And he's probably support. wondering, whatever happened to that retirement, <laughs> Gail? <laughs> yeah, that went, that went on an interesting path. But <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I love, I just love your passion for television and the importance of television and, and you know, the, the, your conviction about television, not just building brands, but building the economy. So it's just been uh, wonderfully fun to kick off the ARF's My CBS pleasure. Uh, with fun. this interview and just thrilled and can't wait to go off to our webcast and, uh, and have a really great 2016 together. Great. Looking forward to it.